Hey, hello Riverland and Long Prairie Gray Eagle. I know I begin it the same way every time, but um, teaching uh, to me is a, it's an act of hospitality, <clears throat> I think, which is a, a value from the rule of St. Benedict. I don't know if you guys know who that is. And I often think of myself as a host, so I'm always um, greeting and bidding people um, farewell. Like everything, classes have a beginning and a middle and an end, and I've got a few traditions I keep going, so i got to keep going. So here's what I have for you uh, today. Probably a little bit of a briefer lesson, because I, again, I'm in that spot where the lesson I gave last Friday, and yes, it's Sunday, on kind of a monochromatic uh, late October day, a lot colder than it should be. Um, I'm, I'm a little behind getting you that. And um, Again, it's the, job, the, the, the task, the human activity is about me trying to replicate somehow a facsimile of in an online video for YouTube that was about a class that I had live. And particularly on Friday, I know there's days where I just talk and because I have to, I, there's things I have to communicate. Um, I, I'm not much of a lecturer, I like to story tell. But f Friday was pr pretty interactive and I had three um, questions. Uh, that I put before my students and it's again it's one of those days where I just kind of report on uh, what it was like to ask those questions and tell you what kind of answers I got but I can still ask you the question uh, too and, and, and call on you to think um, the, the, think about the same things um, I think this stuff is important I and mean, you might be shrugging your shoulders and that's okay but we are again turning our attention to uh, great um, some great American writers um, we're not done learning about writing. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, this is where we roll up our sleeves and truly start studying uh, writers. Uh, it, great writers can sometimes be offer extraordinary lessons uh, about how it's done, how to create sentences, how to use language, how to tell how to tell a, a good story. So we'll get to those three questions, and um, oh, but I want to start with a poem today um, by a book of poetry that's kind of hard for me um, because there's some real darkness in it and light and the poet here is Ilya Kaminsky. Uh, Ilya Kaminsky is, is, is young, he's a rising star uh, in American literature although he's originally um, from um, what we used to call the Soviet Union, now we call it uh, Russia like we did in the olden days. The book is called uh, Deaf Republic and let me just tell you a couple things about Ilya Kaminsky. Ilya Kaminsky um, he wrote a book um, called Deaf Republic because he's deaf and he's deaf because of something kind of sad that happened. I, anytime you get a sore throat, get, be sure to get it checked out um, because if it's strep and you don't get it checked out and taken care of, not everyone knows this, strep can, go, can leave your throat and attack any organ in your body. And I know this because my sweet mother who's now 91 and a half she very nearly died of, uh, from what happened when strep went into her throat, in her heart. And she, it, she got something called rheumatic fever. She spent my entire junior year of high school in, in bed and then later needed a valve operation. They had to open her up to the sky in the year 2000. So get that checked out. Well, Ilya, sweet Ilya Kaminsky, had strep throat when he was a little boy and the doctor misdiagnosed it or missed it and it went into his ears. And so he can barely hear. And the curious thing about Ilya Kaminsky, who's the best friend of the last poet that I got to host live, Kava Akbar, Ilya, when you when you listen to him speak, he he sounds he sounds almost like a person who would who can hear properly. You can catch catch it a little bit on, that it's he's speaking a little bit differently. But when he reads his poetry, it's it's strange is not the right word, unusual, because he's not reciting the poem performing the poem as, he, as much as he is singing the poem. So it's got this, you know, the, the, the first line of, of his poem that I'm not going to read you, we were happy during the war. It's like, we were happy during the war. I mean, it's just this lilting up and down and up and down. And, um, it's, it can be so difficult for audiences that if you ever go to an Ilya Kaminsky poetry reading, he will give you a handout that has all the poems so you can read them while he is um, um, singing them. This is a, has some scary um, poems in it, and the premise is relatively simple. This is about a mythological town that is being tyrannized by a totalitarianism. Totalitarianism. That's a hard word to say, isn't it? 
totalitarian regime. Totalitarianism is not dead, you guys. It's making a huge comeback. It's sort of uh, here, arriving. But the premise of the book is the story begins with um, some townspeople attending a, pu a puppet show. And I'll do a crap job of trying to be the puppeteer. But this little boy um, who's deaf rebels against one of the soldiers. And the, and the soldier shoots him in the head. And instantly, everyone in the town goes deaf. Absolutely everyone. And each poem, in some ways, is a retelling of one instance after another where the soldiers, the evil soldiers, are lured uh, to a puppet theater. And one by one, the, the townspeople take care of them, and uh, the puppeteer uh, takes care of them. And um, there's just a, there's a little bit too much too much sex in it. Okay, I'm trying to have a PG kind of life at the age of 60. This is still an extraordinary poem. Ilya Kaminsky, Gunshot. Our country is the stage. When soldiers march into town, public assemblies are officially prohibited. But today, neighbors flock to the piano music from Sonia and Alfonso's puppet show in Central Square. Some of us have climbed up into trees. Others hide behind benches and telegraph poles. When Petya, the deaf boy in the front row, sneezes, the sergeant puppet collapses, shrieking. He stands up again, snorts, shakes his fist at the laughing audience. An army jeep swerves into the square, disgorging its own sergeant. Disperse immediately! Disperse immediately! The puppet mimics in a wooden falsetto. Everyone freezes except Petya, who keeps giggling. Someone claps a hand over his mouth. The sergeant turns toward the boy, raising his fingers. You! You! The puppet raises a finger. Sonia watches her puppet. The puppet watches the sergeant. The sergeant watches Sonia and Alfonso. But the rest of us watch Petya lean back, gather all the spit in his throat, and launch it at the sergeant. The sound we do not hear lifts the gulls off the water. Now I read this poem to every class I taught, all three, on Friday. And there was no point in bringing the idea up uh, for my Comp 1 classes, but if, if you can see this on the page, each line is a measured thing, right? The, uh, Ilya Kaminsky, the poet, just hit return once. But before the gunshot, which we don't see, we only know that it happens, he hits the space bar twice and creates something I'm absolutely fascinated about, white space. Um, I love language and I love reading and I'm, I'm interested in the words and what they sign and what they signify, but I'm also fascinated by what happens in between the words, in between the lines. And I think of it as, as white space, man, and, and um, I, I, find that, I find that fascinating. And the reason why I brought it up to my classical mythology class is because we're reading, we have been reading Greek tragedies now for weeks. We're finishing up this week with Medea and then we're going to move on to Rome and then the medieval period, uh, mythological-wise. But if you ever read Aeschylus, uh, Sophocles, or Euripides, in the olden days, uh, at the theater of Epidaurus 25 centuries ago in Boeotia, Boeotia, the violence is never part of the play. Everything happens off stage. Oh, I'm, I'm about to run out of battery. Hang on here. Oh, sorry about that. Rough cut. Um, I also tried to stir a conversation with classical mythology about the idea that it would be neat if Hollywood, the entertainment industry, gave us a little more white space. Um, or to put it another way, room for our imagination, elbow room for our imagination to, to, to work a little bit. Um, but that's not the way things have been going. For, for many decades I've been watching Hollywood, just to use it as, as an example, cinema every year gets more violent and more pornographic and, and just, just graphic and in, a, in an in-our-face kind of way. And 
I've got a sweet guy in my classical mythology class named Kyle Dewey who, like me, has stopped watching TV. He wants to go back to a, a simpler time when, when we didn't need all that um, loudness. So, again, summarizing just a little bit of, of what we talked about um, in my Comp 1 classes on Friday, and I'll, I'll put the questions before you. And I, and we, again, we can't have the conversation. I wish we could. Um, Riverland wanted this asynchronous. I wanted it live Zoom, but I'm just doing what I'm told. I'm trying to do as good as I can, as well as I can. Question one was, um, how, how important to you, I'll ask you, I'll just ask you, think about it for a moment. How important is it for you to know things about a writer or an artist? It could be a painter, a sculptor, uh, somebody who's directing dance. How, what, do you want to know about them? Do you care? Um, and examples would be, do you care when you pick up a writer, a book, do you want to know what the writer's background is? What kind of education they had? Maybe what kind of socioeconomic class they came from? How educated were they? Do they are they are they a religious person or not? Unaffiliated or, or devoted devoted to something? Um, do they have any kind of life philosophy or values driving their art? And as always, I've asked this question for a long time because I think it matters. Um, some people said, "Well, if I get interested in the book." Maybe, um, but there's always people who, who are like, no, who cares? Who, I just want the book. I just want the painting. I don't need to know about the painter. I just want to watch the, the, the dance or listen to the symphony. I don't need to know anything about the composer. And how you answer that question is uh, a way of classifying yourself a, a, as a writer, a reader. And we'll delve more deeply into the, this idea as, as we move on. You don't have to be like me. I'll flip the card over it right now. I, I didn't do it on Friday, but I'm kind of a rough new historicist, um, although I, I don't like labels at all. But that, that really, a simpler way of putting it is, I want to know everything. I want to know absolutely everything. I want to know what the, what the writer ate for breakfast, whether they drank coffee or not. Um, whether I just, I, I, every, it's all interesting to me because people are so interesting to me. I do understand uh, people who just want the text, and just want the art. That's fine. We can we can still be friends. And there's days where maybe I'm like that too. But I I want to know everything about the writer, and everything about the situation that gave rise to that art. Okay. Uh, so that was question one, and, and and you can think about that. I also, um, I'll just take my nine o'clock class. I've got, um, I've got a slightly older cat in there uh, named Javi who I've brought up before. No, that's my 10 o'clock class. We'll, put, we'll talk about 10 o'clock. Not much different than the nine. A lot of PSEO students, right? So I've got a lot of people as young as 16, uh, 17, 18 years old. And then I got Javi who was born in, in 1987. But the question was, um, what's your generation's name? Like, what's it called? I think the answer I got back was um, Generation uh, Z. And um, then, then the question became, okay, what, what does your generation stand for? In both classes, this time out, I got a fairly favorable tilt. Um, in the last couple of years, I've felt a little self-loathing. Like, like, wow, we're just the generation of the internet. We're the generation that stares at our phone. This time out, um, led by a woman named Bridget Bond, she said, you know what, we're, we're, our generation is more tolerant. We are more patient. We are more open-minded. Uh, and I remember asking her, are you, is that, are you, so are, are you like or different than your mama? Um, I'm speaking briefly in black vernacular. Well, that made her, that made the class laugh. And she laughed because she and her mother apparently are, 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 are quite alike. Um, so there was some back and forth uh, on that question, and let me just tell you why I would ask such a question. I'm, I haven't, like speaking personally, I'm a, I'm a member of a generation. I'm a baby boomer, but just barely. The baby boomers were born between 1945 and 1960, and we are the biggest generation in the history of history. Um, when all those, well, we lost 550,000 boys in World War II, but when those soldiers came home, they had to do something to sublimate their aggression. And they made babies like never before once they, once, once they got back to the States. So, and I'm born like in the last month, second to the last, I'm born in November of 1959. My birthday's coming up. I hope you get me something nice. And so I've, I've, I'm barely part of it. I've never quite felt like part of the, the, of the 
baby boom generation. I've always identified with younger people, younger generations, whether it's art or music. And I said the obvious, you know, if there's a baby boom that runs between 45 and 1960, I've read entire books on this. It means that the, oh, the world's economy, the United States economy is geared to us. When we were little, we wanted BB guns and, um, you know, coonskin hats because of Davy Crockett, this television show. Well, now we're looking for uh, knee replacements and uh, patio homes. And um, if, if you want guaranteed income, um, b study mortuary science. Um, become an undertaker or a mortuary, mortician. Because there's going to be a definite tomb boom uh, starting around uh, 2030, if it hasn't begun already. And why am I thinking in this way? Because Ernest Hemingway, our first writer, uh, is from the lost generation. Okay, that's the name of his generation. Gertrude Stein called them that at a party in Paris one night. And it's a tighter breadth of years than the baby boom generation. Between 1896 and 1900, and I'm taught to think in this way by the great Malcolm Cowley, the greatest writers that ever, ever wrote in the United States of America, the giants as far as I'm concerned that walked the earth, were born. And I'll drop a few of the names and it's not going to be all of them. I'm talking Hemingway, the great William Faulkner, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Thomas Wolfe, Catherine Ann Porter, uh, Malcolm Cowley, Kenneth Burke, Thornton Wilder, who, Thornton Wilder, who we're going to end the semester with, a uh, fantastic playwright. They were, all came, and, and of course, being born right then, um, made them the perfect age for soldiering once World War I came around, because they were all teenagers. Um, and, and that was a war people wanted to go to. We'll talk about that another day. To, to me, they're, to me this, is, this is the most important writers to study. I wouldn't be putting them for you if I, I didn't think they were um, just a, a bedrock fundamental uh, place to start um, your education regarding American literature, if you haven't started it already. So it, I just wanted to make you think briefly about being part of a generation. And then probably a more fun question for them was the third question, which was, put your hand up if you want to skydive. Okay, how many of you want to skydive? Right now on Zoom, I want to see it. And hands went into the air. And I'm like, Brandon, crawl, what, crawl, what is the matter with you? Why would you, you, you're telling me you'd want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Well, the answer was yes. Um, Brandon wants to do that, and a bunch of them did. And then I said, how many of you want a bungee jump? Well, um, well, for the adrenaline rush, right? Uh, it would be a rush, as we say. That's, we've been saying that for a while, uh, in terms of vernacular speech. Um, I'm 60. I, I, I don't even fly on planes, let alone even think of, about the idea of jumping out of one. I want to be as safe and as comfortable as possible. And, and if that's cowardly, I, I get it. Another way that I asked the question was, okay, right now what I want to know, and I asked this of my 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock class, what I want to know right now is, how many of you young men, within one week of getting your driver's license, just kind of had to see what it would feel to go 100 miles an hour in a car, at least for a moment? And this kid just burst out laughing. And I said, did you do that? And I, th I think that was Hunter, Hunter Olson admitted not only that he did it, but he did it on the way home from the driver's license bureau, from his, the, day, the day he passed his test he did it. There's something in particular about young men uh, and danger, and I basically had to tell them, you guys, Heming, uh, Faulkner's complicated, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald in terms of themes, thematically, they were complicated men. Hemingway is dead simple. Hemingway was all about danger. And I feel like a school mom with a flower print dress with a beehive hairdo and pencil sticking out of it because every English major has said this who comes, brushes up against Hemingway. The, conceptually, there's something you need to understand here called the epiphany of danger, which was Hemingway's deal. In his stories, he again and again and again, as you saw in The Short Happy Life of Francis McComer, he puts characters in the face of mortal danger. It could be a bull coming at you if you're running the bulls at Pamplona. It could be a gigantic marlin, which we're going to meet. I'm getting ahead of myself there. It could be a, a, a monster, a lion, rushing at you out of the African um, bush. And in that moment, in that epiphany of uh, you either find raw, manly courage and survive, or you're destroyed. 
and um, that's the story of uh, uh, Francis. He's a coward all the way up until that moment, and then suddenly he's he's freed uh, of, of of his fear. Talking about courage right now is uh, manly courage, is what I'm talking about, it is uh, very unfashionable because the masculine I identity is being deconstructed in these not very fair, well-spoken days. Um, but I'm talking about it, and I've, I place an, an importance in that. Hemingway did the same thing in his life, and I'll cover that more thoroughly as I try to communicate to you um, how I feel about him and why he's important to me. In, in his own life, uh, he was always seeking danger, uh, whether that was hunting. He himself as a young man, ran the bulls of Pamplona, ran from them barefoot in those streets. Men die every year uh, with that uh, strange ritual. And he just, he just, he was just a happy man with a gun in his hand uh, outside. He needed to be outside underneath that sky. Um, I'll try to uh, get your video up in the day. It should get up like Monday. Um, Monday's video should get up on Monday, but it's just kind of hard to keep up with everything. And uh, I got this poet coming in and I just became the confirmation director for my parish Wednesday nights. Like I needed another 25 students, but nobody stepped up to do it. I did, um, but it doesn't matter. Wednesday night is not a school night. Uh, I can sleep in uh, Thursday morning. I hope you're well down there. I hope you know that November is going to be actually a warmer month than October. I've looked ahead at the advanced uh, extended forecast. And if AccuPlacer is correct, we're going to have some 40s and even some 50s coming our way. And I know it'll be even warmer down in Austin, Minnesota, and Medford, and some of those towns where, where you live. Now, you stay safe, and I will see you soon.